Join me as I explore the rise and fall of central Mexico's city of the gods, Teotihuacan, a metropolis of mega proportions that thrived for centuries, then mysteriously collapsed. Who built Teotihuacan and what happened to them? To find out, I float above the ruins, play one of the world's oldest sports, <laughs> make razor sharp tools with volcanic glass, and learn about one man whose bones become my window into the past. It's a search for answers to one of history's great enigmas. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. Like butter. These are the ruins of Teotihuacan. At one point, this was a thriving cultural center. Some believe this was the first great city of the Western Hemisphere. But after centuries of dominance, it suddenly collapsed. Its inhabitants left us no readable documents to explain why, just their monuments, their art, and their graves. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein, and I've come here to central Mexico to explore the fate of this city's people. And there's no better place to start than with the ruins of the city itself. Pyramids dominate the city skyline. Today, three major ones still stand. But in the past, as many as 200 smaller pyramids, all just a few feet from each other, dotted the city. Construction started in the first century AD. At its height, around 450 AD, almost 150,000 people lived here in specially designed apartment complexes. The city stretched out for some 20 square miles, making it one of the ancient world's largest cities. Then, sometime after 550 AD, the city was suddenly abandoned, with no records left to explain what happened. Teotihuacan is located some 30 miles from modern-day Mexico City. It's easy to confuse the Teotihuacanos with the Maya or the Aztecs. But the Maya, who lived hundreds of miles away, were culturally and ethnically distinct from Teotihuacan. The Aztecs, on the other hand, may have descended from the Teotihuacanos. They were the ones who discovered the silent ruins of the city some 700 years after its collapse. the superhuman majesty of the ruins so profoundly impressed them that they immortalized it in their legends. They named this monumental city Teotihuacan, the city of the gods. Today, it's the most visited archeological site in Mexico, but is still one of the least understood. Who built Teotihuacan? I'm here at the on-site museum with Dr. Mike Spence. He's conducted extensive excavations at Teotihuacan. His specialty, analyzing human remains. Mike introduces me to some of the earliest inhabitants, or at least what's left of them. Clues like these have given him insight into the city and its people. When we found these, these revolutionized our understanding of Teotihuacan. We had the idea that Teotihuacan was primarily peaceful. But when we found these, we realized that there was a more sinister aspect to the city. Um, these particular individuals are soldiers, we believe. Mike, how do you know that these guys were soldiers? So you can see that they're wearing these shell collars, and below the collars hanging from them, are a series of, of replicas of human jawbones. The ones here are replicas because this is a museum, or they actually were buried with replicas? No, they were buried with replicas. Oh, really? Replicas meant to symbolize or represent the uh, various kills they made in warfare. So each jaw represents one or a certain number of people they've killed? I think so. Judging from the number of jawbone pendants, we can tell that they were clearly elite soldiers but a closer examination of their remains could tell me a lot more about them and their civilization. Mike takes me to a storeroom, 
stacked from floor to ceiling with ancient remains found at the site. Is that it? Well, there's more in other aisles. Got anything in a size 11? We go on a treasure hunt of sorts. Here's another one. And stack up on the bones of one man who lived here some 2,000 years okay. ago. I'll carry this one. OK. First. He's a critical source of information. Oh, this is like a really scary Christmas yeah. present. <laughs> What'd you get me? You can catch. Yeah, I might give him something. Else. Grab that one. <laughs> That's the femur. femur. Go. The other femur. Ah, I got you. Ah, the tibia. Ah, very good. There you go. We lay the bones out like you'd expect him to be buried. But this wasn't the way his bones were actually found. Put this out like this a little bit, okay. and then these would come back in, sort of flexing the legs, okay. you know? Like and that's how the legs were close together and bent. Mm -hmm. His bent position tells us that he was bound at the feet. And that's not all. Now, the wrists, they would have looked like this, only they would have been underneath would have been behind the pelvis. The pelvis right? yeah. So was it like, was it like this, where they're actually? That's what, right. Yeah, a little height? higher, about Here? the small of the back. Yeah. And in this case, the cause of death was. I think he was probably buried alive. Buried alive, along with two hundred other healthy young people, all sacrificed in a single, seemingly gruesome event. Who were these victims? Fortunately. Bones and teeth store chemical records of oxygen isotopes. These act like geographic markers, allowing us to find out more about these people. Nearly all of the oxygen that goes into the formation of tooth and bone comes from the water we drink. The oxygen isotopes in bones change when a person moves from one place to another. By analyzing these isotopes, scientists can tell where the person lived before he died. The bone told us that he'd been living in Teotihuacan for some years before he was sacrificed. On the other hand, oxygen isotopes in teeth don't change over time. They're imprinted by water we drink in childhood, when our teeth are forming. By comparing these isotopes to those in the water in various places, Mike can tell that this soldier wasn't born here. And the isotopes in the tooth mm -hmm. indicates that he spent his childhood someplace else, not in Teotihuacan, not even near Teotihuacan. How far away? Could have been Highland Guatemala, and that's a thousand or more kilometers away. It could have been Michoacan, which is still two to three hundred kilometers away. So his story, he was born a long distance away, probably Highland Guatemala, arrived at some point in Teotihuacan, became a member of the military, served in Teotihuacan for some years, and then was sacrificed. The other victims have a similar story. Most of them were born elsewhere and moved to Teotihuacan later in life. This suggests that the rulers recruited people from diverse regions of Mesoamerica before sacrificing them at the altar of the state. Isn't that a testament then to the power of Teotihuacan. Yes. So this city had quite an allure. It tells us that this was the premier city of Mesoamerica. So, that, so Teotihuacan was known far and wide it was. for being special. It, it was more than special. It wasn't just an ordinary city, not even an extraordinary city. It was absolutely unique. It was the city where, where time began, where the present universe was formed, where the gods sacrificed themselves to make men. Risking their lives on the battlefield wasn't all that was asked of these soldiers. The state even demanded the ultimate sacrifice at times of peace. Who ordered the death of these people? How did they make this state so attractive that immigrants from so far away gave up their lives for it? I'm on a quest to find out who built the city of the gods. I've examined their bones and found some pretty grisly evidence of sacrifice. Now I'm heading to see their monuments to learn more about the city. 
The scale and magnificence of Teotihuacan has long perplexed archaeologists and scientists. The epic architecture and organization suggest a strong central authority. I've asked Linda Manzanilla, a leading archaeologist in Teo, to tell me more about the city's design. When people first settled here? We have traces of villages towards the southern part of the valley around 400 before Christ. But the beginning of the construction was around 80 AD. Okay. And then we think that there was an elite who planned the city as a model of the Mesoamerican cosmos. So this city was always designed to be something significant? Yes, it seems as it was very planned from the beginning. I learned that the visionary elite responsible for the early stages of construction planned this city in such detail that it's still one of the most impressive examples of city planning in human history. To get a full grasp of this city's scale, Linda tells me I have to get another point of view. All right, up, up, and away. To get to the ancient city of Teotihuacan from here, I have to fly above the modern one. For the wind. <laughs> yeah. So the captain just told me that if we stay low, the wind will take us right over the pyramids. If we go high, it's going to come back this way. Wind direction shifts with altitude. Buenos dias. Salude, salude con la mano. Buenos dias. Around 45,000 people live in the Teotihuacan municipality today. It was a bit voyeuristic. That's not even a third the number who lived here 2,000 years ago. But the way in which this modern city is laid out seems much more haphazard than the ancient one. I was impressed by the size of the city from the ground. But from up here, what I see is a testament to the complexity and sophistication of the people who designed and built this city. I've learned from Linda that the architects of Teotihuacan had something very precise in mind when they laid the city out. We've got the Avenue of the Dead running north-south. At this end, what we call today the Pyramid of the Moon. We don't know what they actually called it back then. And then over here on the east side is the Pyramid of the Sun. Here we can see the avenue. You see, there's, there's a line. Imagine a line going from the Pyramid of the Sun due west. And that crosses the Avenue of the Dead heading north-south. This quadrangle is how archaeologists believe that this city was laid out to a master plan. There's something more to this grid plan than meets the eye. Apparently, every wall, every street going north-south is angled exactly the same. Bearing just shy of true north, they're all angled at 15 degrees, 25 minutes east. The significance of this orientation? It's still a mystery. It's really obvious from up here that nothing in this site is accidental or random. Everything was designed with a purpose. It's as if the rulers wanted their pyramids to compete with the surrounding mountains. The scale and size of the pyramids were perhaps assurance that the elite were so powerful that they can now rival the gods themselves. What else do we know about these rulers and their imperial city? I head back to rejoin Linda Manzanilla, who wants to take me to a place where most people aren't allowed to go. I would like you to wear this. Okay. It's a, it's a tunnel that goes like a serpent towards the center of the pyramid, and it's like the uh, entrance to the underworld. Oh, fun. Yeah. Linda is Good taking ahead. me under the Pyramid of the Sun, one of the biggest pyramids in the world. It rises as high as a 20-story building and is filled in with about three million cubic tons of dirt and rubble. Ah, so this, is this the entrance here? No, no, that's a tunnel made by the archeologist. We should go inside this one. The tunnel we're entering is the only one made by the ancients that's been found so far. But Linda thinks there may be other hidden tunnels. She wants to show me how they're trying to find these and why they may be important. There we go. With hard hats for protection, we descend into the tunnel. Should be fine. Linda believes that this shaft was created by removing loose volcanic rocks from the ground. 
The resulting serpentine tunnel heads down for 300 feet. Tight squeeze, humid, and uh, I can definitely feel the sensation of going down, down into the center of the pyramid. Terminal. Uh -huh. Over the centuries, this tunnel has been looted many times. All that's left of the original interior are a few stone channels that collected the water dripping from the ceiling. A hidden tunnel or chamber would be a real prize for the archaeologists. It could hold secret treasures that offer clues to some of this city's riddles. It's getting hard to breathe. To penetrate the hidden secrets of the pyramid, Scientists are using the latest technological tool. Got yes. something huge and white in the center of the... Oh, yes, this ice. is a muon detector. It's an instrument uh, that we are using to see if, if, if there are chambers that the archaeologists have not seen inside the pyramid. A muon detector. Muon detector, yes. Wow. The muon detector is like a huge X-ray machine. It tracks muons subatomic particles. Just like dental x-rays find cavities in teeth, the muon detector finds cavities in the pyramid above. Most muons get absorbed by the mass of the pyramid and don't reach the detector. But in spots where there are holes or chambers, more muons pass through to the machine where they're recorded and mapped. As for the tunnel, this is where it ends, in four chambers, which Linda says may have represented the four quadrants of the city above. Who knows what clues may have been in these chambers before it was looted? The muon detector will hopefully help improve our knowledge. But it'll take at least another year to measure the muons and work out if there are any hidden chambers. So until then... We'll just let it do its thing. <laughs> In search of clues about the inhabitants of the City of the Gods, I found out about mass sacrifices and possible hidden chambers under the state temple. From above, I saw real evidence that this was a true metropolis. It was a city with a multi-ethnic population ruled by a mysterious elite. How did this city become so grand? What was it that propelled it to greatness? You're going to need this. OK. And we have a flashlight, so okay. let's go. All right. I'll grab my shovel. I'm here with Ken Hirth, an anthropologist and expert on Mesoamerican commerce. He tells me that the source of their power wasn't gold or diamonds. It was a substance called obsidian, volcanic glass. It's hard to imagine that this was the great wealth that propelled the rise of Teotihuacan. So Ken's going to show me what this material was all about and why this versatile stone was the steel of Mesoamerica. Yeah, be careful going down. It's been raining a lot, so it'll be slippery. Ken's taking me to an area where obsidian has been mined since the days of Teotihuacan. Now we're going in, so be careful. It's been raining a lot, and we don't want to have roof collapse. Okay, yeah. That would not be good. This ancient mine was converted into a modern shaft, and it's still mined today. Ken explains that the roof is completely unsupported. Recent rains have soaked the ground and weakened the walls. Just two days ago, a tunnel collapsed. And that's not something we want to happen while we're inside. Hopefully, the miner's prayer candle will offer us some protection. The miners dig until they find a vein of obsidian, and then they'll follow the vein uh, taking out the nodules that they can, uh, they can find. Be careful, it's really tight here. Uh, I like it that way. Ken and I are now a long way in. We can no longer see the mouth of the tunnel. But we've asked some of the miners to wait near the entrance, just in case something happens. Josh, here's a good spot. All right. Oh, wow, look at that. Yeah, you can... You can see the natural obsidians embedded in a, uh, a soil ash matrix. Wow, there's obsidian everywhere. Look at this. So this was 
gold, but to them, obsidian. this was this was the valuable stuff. Yeah. Right. So let's just yeah. uh, see if we can find a good quality piece. Uh -huh. Can we take a piece from like up here? Would that be unwise? Uh, we could, but uh, the roof might collapse. We're better off <laughs> looking. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, focus on the floor. Yeah. Fo focus on the floor. Okay. And what is it that we're looking for? What makes one piece of obsidian better than another? Well, the quality of the glass, no inclusions or veins, because that makes it easier to flake. Uh, and that's what the people at Teotihuacan would have been looking for. Might be good. This one here? That one is very good. Yeah? Let's just test it and see what quality glass it is. How do you test it? Uh, I've got a little hammer stone. If we just uh, knock off a couple flakes. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, that is good quality glass. All right. That one's mine. OK. This may be another good quality piece here. Okay. Yeah, it looks like pretty good glass. So I've got one? I'll take this one. Ken says that there's something the special surface. about this obsidian, but we need to get a good look at it in the light. Outside the mine, there's a debris area where miners have left their rejects. You'll see that what makes this obsidian unique, but even the rejects carry the hallmark of what makes this, this obsidian spot. unique. You'll see that it uh, has a green golden sheen to it, wow, which uh, was important to pre-Hispanic people. They thought green stone was alive, and so it had a symbolic importance. Uh, whether it was a green obsidian or jade, it was uh, symbolically important to them. This green uh, quality obsidian you won't find in any other obsidian in Mexico or anywhere in the New World. It wow. only occurs here. So if anyone had a green obsidian blade, it came from here. It came from here. See the, uh, right. the old shafts. One of the secrets to Teotihuacan's success was their control of this source of rare green obsidian. But the city was also surrounded by two other huge obsidian deposits and several small ones. The raw materials and tools found in various stages of production at Teo show that every aspect of obsidian manufacture was controlled by the city. Well, let's just, uh, Ken and I head to a nearby campsite and, and where he and other archaeologists do their field work. He wants to show me how to shape obsidian into the tools of the era and demonstrate the unusual qualities of this stone. What we want to shape is uh, something like this. It's called a macro core, mm -hmm. and it's uh, made by percussion flaking mm -hmm. and has a, a flat platform that we take our flakes off of. Okay. What we'd like to produce are nice parallel sided uh, ridges. This is what we want to create. And this is what we're starting That's with. what we're starting with. Okay. Right. Show me how. Okay. Hammerstone. Hammerstone in hands. Tricky, tricky, tricky. Yeah. Creating a core is standard flint napping procedure, but napping obsidian okay, is tricky. You know can I just come in hard and heavy right here and, <laughs> and see if Pro I can restore? Probably not. It flakes off very easily. If you're not careful, huge chunks would break off, and you'd be left with a lot of useless bits. And I don't want that. Yeah. That's good. Good. That's a good one. Yeah, just like that, all the way around. To learn flint napping, you got to break a lot of rock. Once they have a percussion core like this, they use these ridges to start making blades. Like this, is a, this is a Teotihuacan finished core, mm -hmm. and what you can see are all the parallel ridges are the uh, spots where uh, blades came off. Mm -hmm. Looks like this. So, so one of the things that the Teotihuacan flint nappers were making with long skinny blades like this. Long skinny blades. Mm -hmm. They would have basically... The Teotihuacanos would have braced themselves between trees or stumps. But Ken has created this portable rig. Holding the core with his feet, he has to apply just the right amount of pressure. It takes skill and precision. Something that Ken has developed over many, many hours of hard practice. Good one. Nice. Oh, that's great. This core is a blade factory. You can flake off blade after blade from it. You can see where they came off the core. And that's just what the Teotihuacanos did. That's great. And we know that they made these, right? Right. These right. replicate exactly what archaeologists have found. Exactly. Archaeologists have found Teotihuacan green obsidian tools all over Mesoamerica, in sites thousands of miles away. 
this subsidian trade was key in making Teotihuacan the economic center of Mesoamerica. Traders and craftsmen carried these cores to distant towns and flaked off blades on the spot for their customers. The city not only controlled the export of obsidian, it also controlled the human skill it took to shape it. And that skill was vital. The, they were a Stone Age society. They didn't have metal. Uh, they manufactured all their cutting edge from obsidian, which is the sharpest cutting edge you know, that you can manufacture, uh, even sharper than surgical stainless steel. Sharpest edge you can manufacture even today. Even today. Uh, that's so cool. I want to explain what's going on here. Some of the local miners have actually brought in a goat, which they're going to prepare for dinner. But I want to make a point using obsidian. The reason why obsidian blades were found all over Mesoamerica is because everyone had to eat and everyone needed a knife. Obsidian was the most important tool when it came to processing. This is what puts the meat on the table. They would use the obsidian blades for, for weaponry, and, and then also they used it for ceremonial activities. They would let their own blood to give it to the gods. And so a small lancelet, they could pierce their tongue or their ears and draw blood and, and uh, then offer it as an offering to the gods. Blood was sacred. Wow. So this is practical, ceremonial, and sacred. Why don't I let these guys come in and take their goat back? Gracias. Teotihuacan's control of this versatile substance made them an economic powerhouse. Their sphere of influence extended well beyond their borders. I'm trying to piece together the story of Teotihuacan. I've seen a master-planned metropolis and evidence of mass human sacrifice. Now I've discovered that a unique Stone Age technology was the source of its power. Obsidian made Teotihuacan the dominant culture in the region. But how did this concentration of wealth and authority impact its citizens? To find out, we have to go to an apartment complex on the site. Some 300 years after Teo was established, city planners shifted the emphasis from the construction of monumental architecture to the construction of more than 2,000 residential compounds in the city. I'm back with Mike Spence, and he tells me that in its prime, around 450 AD, close to 150,000 people lived in Teotihuacan. That's a residence. People would have been eating and sleeping and living in here. To accommodate them, these apartments were designed and built on a scale unprecedented in history. This is absolutely unique. Mesoamerica hasn't seen anything like this before, and this wasn't practiced anyplace else in Mesoamerica at this time. Is there any way to know if, like, if this was a major switch for the living lifestyles of these people? I suspect the state had to use a little bit of muscle to get people into these. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see it is sort of state design. There's commonalities in all of them that suggest that. So here, this is, this is a residence? That's a residence. By forcefully relocating the people into government housing, the ruling elite tightened their grip on daily life. But the social engineering didn't stop there. Political indoctrination was incorporated into the decor of every home. And that is my next clue. Teotihuacan may have had a written language, but scholars haven't been able to decipher it yet. So another way we can learn about this society is by studying the art and artifacts they've left behind. I'm now heading to an apartment complex here on the site to meet an art historian, and I'm hoping she can tell me more about this civilization. Her name is Kim Goldsmith. She's been studying the mural art in Teotihuacan for more than 15 years. She says that the artwork is as well-planned as the architecture of the city. We stop at a recurring icon, an image of a priest. Aren't these fabulous? That's amazing. So what can these tell us about the people of Teotihuacan? Well, we could learn a lot more if we had more. We probably have about 1.1% of their mural artwork remaining. But in general, the mural paintings of Teotihuacan are really representing state symbolism as trying to be really a state propaganda. Even in your own house, on the inside of your house, you're not allowed to pick what you're going to put on your walls. You are going to have a state-mandated theme 
inside your house. So it's visually mesmerizing everybody into saying, we're the greatest, we're the best, go team. Really? So there's some sort of programming going on through yes, the murals? Yes, definitely. And it works. It works very, very well. The mural art was like a political campaign for the elite. Archaeologists believe these ornate drawings of high priests, ritual, and sacrifice were painted on the walls in every single home in the city, burning their message into the minds and the hearts of their people. It's as if the murals were used to impose the will of the state on every individual. Was this the climate in which the sacrificed soldiers lived? a climate where they might have accepted that they'd one day give their lives up for the state. Kim takes me around the corner to see another mural. She thinks this room might have been a school. They're really beautiful. What we saw down there. It's very different because this is more of a slice of everyday life. These are men playing all different kinds of games, and I'm sure they must have played during, during the time period of the city. Looks like here they're playing bocce or marbles or something. Yeah, some kind using, of a ball game. And, using balls, yeah. And you have a fellow getting a piggyback ride <laughs> okay, yeah. right here. And oh, here's another plane. This is there. very interesting. These two fellows are playing. Here's the ball. It looks like they're playing using their hips without being able to touch it with their hands. It looks like they're going to a lot of trouble to avoid touching it, in fact. Maybe it has even a continuance in modern times today, some relative of it. What game? There is a game where they play it in a court like this? Some people play a game like it, very much so. Everything in the City of the Gods had a religious or ritual aspect. If the rest of this culture is any indication, the game probably wasn't child's play. To find out if this game can offer me more insights into this imperial culture, I travel to western Mexico, where the game is still being played. Here, I meet Ricardo Urquijo, a local who knows a lot about the game, called Hip Ulama. So this is the game, huh? Yeah, this is Ulama. They're using a taste, which is the field ground, mm -hmm. and here you have this line, which is right in the middle, and it's called analco. When they... Uh, cannot respond, then that's a point for this team. It's a bit like volleyball. Each team tries to hit the ball back to the other side. Ha! Except, of course, here, they're using their hips instead of their hands. And how many points until you win? Eight. The game has a history dating back before the Aztecs, and even before the Teotihuacanos, stretching back some 4,000 years. Then is it okay if I give it a try? Sure. Yeah. Va a probar Josh con ustedes, muchachos. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Wait, you guys have your shoes off. Bring it on. That's to me. Ah. Oh. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> learning to play ulama is all about learning to flick your hips. That and getting hit by an eight-pound ball. I'll tell you one thing. When the ball hits you, you can feel it. It's heavy. Oh. And it's just like a massive amount of rubber, and I'm gonna have a, a nice bruise to play, but it's fine. This is seemingly playful stuff, an innocent ball game. But it turns out it wasn't innocent at all. This game between competing teams may have symbolized the battle between the gods in the sky and the lords of the underworld. The ball itself may have symbolized the sun. The rulers of Teotihuacan took a physical game and turned it into a supernatural ritual. Once again, the heavy hand of the state made its mark on daily life. So, Ricardo, any sense of how the rules or the game has changed over the last 2,000 years? They have changed a lot because uh, in Teotihuacan days, the winner was uh, sacrificed to the gods. To have fertility, good crops, rain. So you'd, you'd want to die through yes. this game? Yes, right. Because to me, as someone who's playing now, like, I, I would think the loser would die. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, we beat you. You die, you yeah. know? But you're saying that actually it was the honor of the winning team right. to be right. sacrificed in one of right. the highest ways possible. Yes, of course. 
Okay, did we win or lose? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I lost. Uh... I'm glad to be going back unharmed. Well, mostly. But I've learned something. In Teotihuacan, the dominance of the state was so complete that for centuries, people were asked to give up their lives for it in war and in peace. I'm trying to understand the mysterious city of Teotihuacan. I've crawled into volcanic glass mines, examined human bones, and played one of the world's oldest sports. Once, people gave up their lives for this all-powerful state. But no city can last forever. It's time to explore how it fell. A vital clue is found in an unlikely substance, lime. When originally constructed, each pyramid was plastered with lime, which was then beautifully painted by artists. Elizabeth Soyero, a scientist who's studying the impact Teotihuacan had on its environment, is exploring a theory that's becoming increasingly popular. This is an oven where the Teotihuacans uh, produced lime, lime to plastic the pyramids. So how do you make lime? Does it need a lot of wood? They need it a lot, yeah. Lime is really just burnt and powdered limestone mixed with water. And to make lime from scratch, I'd have to keep this kiln burning at 800 degrees for at least eight hours. That would take a lot of wood. Back in the day, the city was surrounded by thick forests. When the Teotihuacans started to live here, the, all the mountain was plenty of, of uh, pines. If we were here 2,000 years ago, there were trees here, mm -hmm. pine trees. Mm -hmm. Wow. Elizabeth tells me that to get a sense of how much lime was used by the city, I'll have to make some lime mortar myself. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all. Wow, it feels as hot. But yeah, because the reaction is very strong and produce heat. A lot of heat, a lot of heat. Yeah. It's impressive. In order to maintain their city, the Teotihuacanos plastered and replastered the walls again and again. To do this, they would have probably kept kilns burning around the clock. It's been estimated that they used roughly 30,000 tons of wood each year to build and maintain the plaster on the city. That's about 3,000 acres of forest cut down and burnt each year over centuries. It's as if they were smearing their forests all over their walls. The forests never recovered from this abuse. Neither did the city. The resulting soil erosion slashed farm productivity, setting the stage for crisis. Scientists believe that during the final days of Teotihuacan, pine forests, like this one, were almost completely wiped out. At the same time, the city began to spiral out of control. Was environmental degradation caused by humans the real reason the city of the gods collapsed? What was the final straw? Once again, the answers may lie in the graves. Mike is taking me to a grave in one of the apartment complexes. Apparently, Teotihuacanos frequently buried their relatives right in their own courtyard. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Huh. Yeah, it's, it's been excavated by the archaeologists and, and then, then they resealed it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've already seen the graves of elite soldiers, sacrificed with riches to the gods. Now Mike wants to show me what archaeologists found in the graves of average citizens. So this is a kind of material that was found in graves. And you can see it's a sort of reflection of the wealth of Teotihuacan. You've got green stone, you've got marine shell, you've got coral, all of this coming in from some distance away. These may not look like much to you and me, but these objects were treasured by the people of Teotihuacan, the kind of things you'd bury with a loved one. For centuries, people knew they'd take some of these things with them to their graves but all that changed as the forests got depleted. Wow, so these types of items 
were found in graves like that? Yes. Uh -huh. Throughout Teotihuacan. Well, uh, not entirely. They were in the earlier years of Teotihuacan. Uh, this wealth seemed to flow fairly freely throughout the city. Some people had less than others, but everybody had some. And then that changed? In the later years, yes. Uh, that kind of material would be found only in the graves of the richer people toward the center of the city. So we're seeing a polarization of the wealth There's classes. a growing gap between the upper class and the lower classes. So it sounds like something is changing internally at Teotihuacan. Uh, something's going drastically wrong in the last century or so. What environmental factors? Once again, it's the teeth that tell the story. Well, uh, we examined the teeth, and we were able to see these lines of growth interruption in their teeth, and those increased late in the uh, apartment compound history so that uh, people were apparently suffering a lot of episodes of growth interruption, which means episodes of infection, malnutrition, perhaps trauma. Yeah. Teotihuacan, it seems, had gotten too big to sustain itself. With the forests depleted, the farmlands insufficient to sustain the dense urban population the city was literally crumbling under its own pressure. But did people just abandon it and migrate elsewhere? I head back to Linda Manzanilla to put the final pieces together. She has startling new evidence that the city was deliberately burned. On the top, we have excavated them, and we see the burning of the city around 550 AD. These mounds are the remains of Teotihuacan's administrative center still in the early stages of excavation. So this is what it looks like before archaeologists right. clean it all up. Right. This is how the These tarps are, are here to protect some of the most important archaeological evidence yet discovered at Teo. For example, you see here the stucco floors mm -hmm. originally were white, and oh. you have Black. the ceiling collapsing, and uh, the beams are burning and falling. That's what this says to an archaeologist. You yes. can tell by looking at this floor. Because to me, I can see the discolorations here. Yes. But you're saying that 1,500 years ago, a ceiling collapsed on fire and fell here. Well, I knew you were going to ask that, and I brought a sample of the carbonized wood of the... When excavations began here in the early 90s, Linda's team found the charred remains of massive roof beams littering the floor, as if from a great fire, a fire that marked the end of a civilization. Carbonized wood is fragile, so Linda has brought only this tiny sample. The rest has been removed and carefully tested to determine the date of the fire. So we have the dates of the construction of the white part and mm -hmm. then the dates of the fall with the black part. Why does this fire say internal revolt and not just wildfire came through and burned everything? Because the, the fire was selective particularly in the temples and the places where the rulers and the decision-making was made. Uh, so a wildfire, if it did come in and burn, would have burned everything, everything indiscriminately. Everything, all the site, right. For centuries, Teotihuacan's rulers dominated every aspect of life, even demanding the ultimate sacrifice. In return, they promised to bless and protect the people. When these promises fell flat, it seems the people exacted the perfect revenge on their masters and their monuments. It was a no-confidence vote on the existing power structure, carried out on an unsurpassed scale. Overnight, this magnificent metropolis that dominated the region for centuries was reduced to a shadow of its former self, never to rise again. A civilization that thrived on order collapsed in chaos. This week, join me as I search for evidence of the Great Trojan War as told in Homer's The Iliad and the Odyssey. This is a big, big deal. 
Did Helen of Troy really cause an epic 10-year war between the Greeks and the Trojans? Did the Greeks really win the war by entering the strong gates of Troy in the belly of a wooden horse? With Homer's works as my guide, I'll follow a trail of clues across the Aegean Sea. I'll dive for ancient shipwrecks. Oh my god, it's amazing. I'll test the tools and weapons of the Bronze Age Greeks. That's a flesh wound. And I'll journey to an island with a history of violent earthquakes. So everything that's down here was basically up there. Where NASA imaging is revealing new evidence that the Trojan War was more than just a good story. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. The ancient Greeks are world famous for their stories, especially those of an epic 10-year battle between the soldiers of Greece and a fortress city called Troy. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein. I've come here to Greece to find out if the stories of the Trojan War could possibly be true. The story of the Trojan War recalls an age of powerful kingdoms on the shores of the Aegean Sea. Greek Mycenae and Troy. It's a tale of war nearly 3,000 years old, all fought over a Greek princess named Helen. She leaves her husband and her home for Troy with her lover, a Trojan prince named Paris. Her actions wreak grave consequences. King Agamemnon gathers soldiers from across the Greek empire and launches an all-out attack on Troy. War rages for 10 long years until the hero Odysseus brings the fighting to an end with a clever trick. The Greeks sneak into Troy in the belly of a wooden horse. They burn the city to the ground and take Helen back to Greece. It's one of history's oldest and most famous stories. But is it true? To find out, I've come to Athens, Greece, to the American School of Classical Studies. Here, copies of two ancient epic poems called the Iliad and the Odyssey are stored. Between them, these two books tell the story of the Trojans and the Greeks, of the war over Helen and Odysseus's long journey home. Ah, so this is where all the rare books are kept. Yes, this is the Mambilas rare book room, and here is where we keep the Homer. Created in Florence, Italy in 1488, this is one of only three remaining copies on Earth from the first ever printing of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Looks like uh, handwriting, but it's actual yeah, printing, you. done on a printing press. But it's not the first written, you said, right? No. It no, existed in, in what form prior right. to Right. Well, we have fragments of the text of Homer on papyri found in the sands of Egypt mm -hmm. that uh, the earliest at probably the third century BC. The first word, right? Dr. Stephen Tracy, the director of the school, tells me that more than 2,000 years before this book was printed, a single mysterious man told the story of the Trojan War in a song. Around 725 BC, late 8th century, this man comes along, whom we call Homer, who had an incredible gift, who was so fluent in this oral art that he could sing a huge long song. We know nothing really about him. Uh, we don't even know if this was his name. The name Homer comes down to us today from Greek historians of the classical age. But his songs recall an age even older. Homer sang of a world that was ancient history, even for the Greeks who built these famous columns and theaters. He recalled civilizations from the dawn of human history, a war story from around 1250 BC, and a city that early scholars dismissed as fantasy. But could Troy have been a real place? Could Homer's stories be true? If they are, then a whole world of ancient kingdoms and brave armies lie waiting to be discovered. And I'm joining the hunt to find them. 
Homer placed Troy in what we now call Turkey, on the other side of the Aegean Sea, roughly 200 miles southwest of what's now Istanbul. He sang of a massive city, strong-walled at the edge of a windy plain. It rested at the southern coast of the Hellespont, a narrow strip of water connecting the Aegean Sea and the Sea of Marmara, what is now called the Dardanelles. The search for Homer's Troy began on a large scale at the end of the 19th century with a German businessman turned archeologist named Heinrich Schliemann. Schliemann amassed a huge fortune in business and he spent it trying to prove that Homer sang about real places and real events. And in 1870, Heinrich Schliemann came here with the Iliad and Odyssey as his guide. He was convinced that the unassuming hill directly behind me was nothing less than the legendary city of Troy. Schliemann was on a hunt for the treasures of the Trojan kingdom and for proof that the war Homer described actually took place. Following clues from the Iliad and the Odyssey, he believed that both Troy and proof of a great war could be found here. With teams of more than 100 local workers, he dug a massive trench straight through the side of this hill. So this is the infamous trench. This was exactly the trench which he dug okay. at the time. Dr. Yashar Ersoy is an archaeologist and an expert on Schliemann's excavations here in Turkey. He decides to cut this huge trench right through this mound, yeah? yeah? I can see how far down he went. I see these rock walls. This is, this is as far as he got, right? These rock walls here? That is right. Okay. That is right. And those are apparently the earliest remains so far he had reached at the site, and they were dating to the early Bronze Age. And what's going through Schliemann's mind at the time? His, ma his main mission was identifying the city of Troy. He was hoping to find, to prove that the stories that Homer told to us were basically realities. In search of Homer's fortress city, Schliemann dug over the course of seven years. His excavations were later condemned as some of the most destructive in the history of archaeology. But he unearthed the remains of an ancient civilization, reminiscent of Homer's descriptions of Troy. And he was thrilled to discover the treasures of an ancient aristocracy. For Schliemann, this collection of gold could belong only to the royal family of Homer's epic. He draped the jewels on his own Helen of Troy, his young wife, Sophia. But it turned out they weren't quite what he thought. He was wrong with his assumption, especially in terms of his dating. This treasury was almost 1,000 years earlier than the time when Priam, Priam lived. But he didn't know that, right? Absolutely not. Archaeologists believe the Iliad and the Odyssey describe a time around 1250 BC. But new scientific dating techniques have determined that the treasures Schliemann discovered were nearly 1,000 years older than that. The gold didn't come from the time Homer described. But that doesn't mean Schliemann was wrong about the place. Within his massive trench, Later archaeologists have discovered multiple levels of civilization here, a series of ancient cities all built over time on the very same hill. And basically what we learned is the fact that Troy apparently had a long history of occupation and excavators identified nine levels at the site from the third millennium BC until the Roman imperial era. So this shows that for 3,200 years, civilizations rebuilt themselves one on top of the other. That is exactly the case. In all, nine separate city levels have been discovered here, dating from 2,900 BC all the way to around 550 AD. These findings have shown this location 
to be the largest and longest occupied human settlement in the area. But is it Homer's Troy? So Yashar, is this the Troy that Homer was writing about? Well, both the archeological evidence as well as the historical sources mm -hmm. strongly suggest the fact that it is the best candidate for the region mm -hmm. as well as for the geography. And apparently Troy is so far the largest site we know of from this area, northwest of Asia Minor. Okay, and Homer's writings confirm, I guess, how he describes Troy, right? They would confirm this location. Indeed so, yeah. Huh. If Homer did write about a real city, it's most likely the Bronze Age fortress here. But finding the city of Troy and finding proof of the Trojan War are two very different things. And like Schliemann, later archaeologists have failed to find strong evidence here of Homer's 10-year war. The search for truth in the Iliad and the Odyssey shifted outside the walls of Troy to the earliest civilizations of Greece. And that's where I'm heading next. I'm on a hunt for the warriors who fought the Trojan War, using clues from the Iliad and the Odyssey. In Turkey, I followed the trail of the poet Homer to the ruins of an ancient city. I learned that buried treasure had been discovered, and that a Bronze Age kingdom existed in the very place Homer described. Now I'm off to continue my search on the other side of the sea. Because if stories of the Trojan War are true, then the walls of Troy were toppled by the Greeks, and the Greeks had a kingdom of their own. I'm now searching for the city of King Agamemnon, which Homer described as Mycenae, rich in gold. Homer sang that the kingdom of Mycenae rested between two ancient landmarks. It was in the north of a plain called the Argive, and south of an area still called Corinthia, in what is now the Greek Peloponnese. Once more, I find myself on the path of Heinrich Schliemann, who followed these clues in 1876, three years after his discoveries at Troy. I've discovered, just as Schliemann did, that the trail of Homer's clues once again lead to the ruins of a Bronze Age city. Mycenae has been on the map at this location for more than 3,000 years. Dr. Vasiliki Pliatsika has been excavating here since 1999. So what did this place look like when Schliemann showed up? Well, the gate was cleared. It was cleared in 1841, so he could see the gate and see the lintel and see the triangle. Mm -hmm. This is pretty much the picture he saw. Schliemann was certain this impressive gate was the entrance to the great kingdom of the Greeks. This emblem of these lions was already here. That's right. What it basically says is that the lions are protecting the royal house of Mycenae, which rules by divine right. In the Iliad, it's King Agamemnon himself who gathers armies from across the states of Greece to launch the attack on Troy. And for Schliemann, proof of Homer's Mycenae would come from finding great wealth and evidence that the mighty king could have lived and ruled here. Passing through the Lion's Gate, one can't miss the site where Schliemann and another huge team launched the first major excavation of this buried city. 125 workmen working for him. 125. He quickly cleared this enormous area just behind the Lion's oh, Gate. He wasn't. He was paying people to do that for him. Okay. And at the bottom of this very grave, Heinrich Schliemann made a discovery beyond his wildest expectations. 31 pounds of gold and beautifully wrought golden death masks. Wait, so he's got bones, he's got gold. What does he think? Well, he thinks these are royal burials, and he thinks he's found Agamemnon's burial. But why? Like, why, why do bones, gold, and masks say Agamemnon to him? Well, he knows from ancient writers that Agamemnon and his people were buried inside the citadel. 
So he thinks, you know, he just puts two and two together. He's got gold, he's got the graves inside the citadel, he thinks this is Agamemnon. But time would prove that two plus two didn't equal four. Yeah, what he found here were kings, but uh, they were too old. They were older than Agamemnon. The gold Schliemann found here was the first in a long string of discoveries at Mycenae. And archaeologists have since proven that this was the most powerful city in the area throughout the entire Bronze Age. That makes this the only possible location for the Greek kingdom Homer described. With the Iliad and the Odyssey as his guide, Heinrich Schliemann rediscovered Troy and Mycenae for the modern world. And generations of explorers have followed in his wake. Today, a new search is on for an island empire described in Homer's Odyssey. If this kingdom is found, it'll add a whole new dimension to the archaeological search for the truth behind Homer's stories. It'll mean the discovery of the home of Odysseus, the man who brought the Trojan horse to Troy and ended the Trojan War. Few locations in the Iliad and Odyssey are as important as an island kingdom called Ithaca, home of Odysseus. New evidence suggests that the location of Ithaca may have been found as discussed in Homer's writings, here off the western coast of Greece on an island called Kefalonia. Kefalonia lies in a small island group called the Ionian Islands. They lie at the very edge of a fault line between two tectonic plates. This is one of the most active earthquake zones on the planet. I'm here with Robert Biddlestone, who believes these earthquakes, maybe hundreds of them over the last 3,000 years, have hidden the location of Homer's Ithaca until now. Right the way out to the sea there. Well, the most important description in the Odyssey of where ancient Ithaca is supposed to be is when King Odysseus announces his identity, and he says, my island of Ithaca lies furthest to the darkness of dusk, in other words, furthest to the west. And when you look at today's map of this part of the world, you find there's an immediate contradiction. Because the modern island of Ithaca doesn't lie furthest to the west, it lies furthest to the east. So the, the description that Homer provides of Ithaca, this kingdom, doesn't match the current island of Ithaca. No, it doesn't. So there's a mismatch, there's a contradiction. And I thought to myself, well, why? Why would he get the geography wrong? Biddlestone's theory begins with identifying a deep ravine separating the westernmost portion of Kefalonia from the main body of the island. He believes this ravine was once a narrow seaway that has since filled in with rubble from earthquakes. If he's right, then the island now called Kefalonia was at one time two islands. And the island farthest west was Homer's Ithaca making the maps which today call another island Ithaca incorrect. The was sea, we're pretty confident here below, but it got filled up by this process of catastrophic rockfall. Wow, so basically everything that we're seeing in this valley was up there on the mountain. Exactly, side. exactly so. Before there was any of this rock slide, we had a marine channel going right the way through. So most scholars agree that this place where you and I are standing right now is ancient Sami, but what they haven't been able to figure out is really where ancient Ithaca was. And I believe it was over there, across this valley. Since Biddlestone conceived his theory, he's gained fantastic insights from NASA global imaging software called Worldwind. With it, he's been able to hover over the island electronically and comb for clues in three dimensions. With the aid of these images, Biddlestone set out to find specific features on the western portion of Kefalonia that fit with Homer's descriptions of Ithaca, like this bay. In it, two headlands projecting, sheared off, crouching from the harbor, shielded from waves, whipped up by blustering winds outside. Well, the fascinating thing is that the description of the harbor in the Odyssey matches almost exactly what we see in front of it. Like Schliemann, Biddlestone is turning ancient poetry into a hunt for historical truths. And he's confident excavations here will eventually prove he's right. 
They row inside the bay. They knew the bay of old. The ship ran up the beach for half its length at speed. Such strength was in the rower's arms. So we've got to have some kind of sandy beach. Wow. OK, so I see what you mean. We have sand. We have sand. No shortage of that. From sandy beaches to mountain peaks, Biddlestone is hot on Homer's trail. Athene is speaking to Odysseus. She says to him, look up there, and you will see your mountain of Mount Neriton covered with waving foliage. And there it is. To date, he believes he's identified 15 separate locations described on Ithaca by Homer more than 2,000 years ago. And each location is a clue that he hopes will one day lead to the palace of Odysseus himself. Oh, so we have, if I can oversimplify, we have a treasure map with all these points on it, but we never had where to start. Well, that's right. And the exciting thing is this. Everyone's imagined that the treasure map was a map of a, myth a mythical treasure island, that it wasn't a real island anyway. You couldn't even find it, again, let alone identify particular mountains or places on it. Mm -hmm. But now we've got a real good chance of being able to demonstrate that Ithaca is real. What Heinrich Schliemann started, Robert Biddlestone will carry into the future. And in the years that have separated these two men, other archaeologists have made a wealth of amazing discoveries on the trail of the Trojan War. I'm on the trail of the Trojan War, following clues left by the poet Homer. I've explored two ancient cities at the center of the story. And on Cephalonia, I learned that earthquakes may have hidden one of the islands described by Homer. But finding these cities is only part of the story. I still have to find evidence of the people Homer described, warriors clad in armor and equipped with the weapons of the late Bronze Age. I've picked up my journey in a town called Naplio, where a pile of teeth have made the world of Homer come alive. Yes. Dr. Eleni Peliologu and conservator Pinka Taratori have invited me to see these ancient remains. It may not look like much, but archaeologists recognized what they discovered immediately from the writings of Homer. This is a big, big deal, and I want to explain why. Because in the Iliad, in Book 10, it says the following. Meriones gave Odysseus bow, quiver, and sword, and over his head he set a helmet made of leather. Inside it was crisscrossed taut with many thongs. Outside, the gleaming teeth of a white tusked boar ran round and round in rows stitched neat and tight, a master craftsman's work, the cap in its center padded soft with felt. Boar's tusked helmet, that's what we're looking at. Here we have the cheek plates, which are made of bronze. Okay, and and they protected the face. So these would go like this that? This way, yes. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Using these fragments as a guide, Pinka made a model of how the helmet might have appeared more than 3,000 years ago. That's what that, huh. okay. so Without Homer's hard. description, the fact that Here. these teeth were actually a Bronze Age helmet might have never been realized. But with the helmet, archaeologists have proven an important historical link between Homer and the warriors he describes. More remnants of these helmets have been found in tombs around Mycenae, the Greek kingdom itself. And back at Mycenae, Dr. Pliatsika and her colleagues have determined that in 1250 BC, this city was the wealthiest and most powerful in all of Greece like it was portrayed in the songs of Homer. They found relics of bronze, cast swords, and arrow points, the same weapons of Homer's Trojan War. And they've discovered a society with a rich warrior culture, just like the Mycenae of the Iliad and the Odyssey. We know that the people who were in charge of a group of soldiers were the heroes were the, the bravest and those who belonged to a higher rank socially. They were viewing themselves as soldiers and hunters. What Homer says is that we've got warriors who are using this kind of weaponry and these were 
people that were higher than the, the simple folk who were working in the fields or as herdsmen. Mm -hmm. So the fact that Homer depicts these people, the people of Mycenae, as this powerhouse, as we've discussed, that's actually pretty dead on. This is a, a, an accurate picture. What Homer says is pretty accurate. Archaeologists' discoveries at Mycenae have linked the words of Homer to the realities of a warrior culture still being uncovered today. Residents of this city in the Late Bronze Age used the weapons described by Homer, from arrowheads to bronze swords to chariots drawn by horses. These chariots were the tanks of the Trojan War. And Homer describes their use in battle repeatedly. In Book 20, he sings, Achilles rampaged on. His sharp-hoofed stallions trampled shields and corpses. Axel under his chariot splashed with blood. I want to see one of these chariots for myself. And we got one here, a chariot. Formidable war machine. Beautiful. And this is the late Bronze Age chariot? Exactly. Uh, Tufan Taronli has reproduced a Greek chariot, matching both Homer's descriptions and artwork from the late Bronze Age. How many riders? Two. A charioteer and a warrior. OK. Covered with leather outside. Leather Two outside. Times. Wicker. I have wicker inside and leather outside. A charioteer running the horses and a warrior fighting. Do we know if the warriors were using chariots as transport or as weapons? We have records of showing that they were doing both, both getting to the field and also doing the war at the field. So one person would be driving, and the other person, passenger, it would be their chariot, and they'd be fighting with, what do you think? Bows Probably and arrows? Bows and arrows spears. and spears. And there is also a record that they might be getting off and then fighting with swords as well. What do you think? Would you like to have a ride? We can go for a ride, too? Yep. OK, let's do it. OK, let's get the horses in then. Arkadaşlar. These horses have modern bridles, but the concept is the same. Two horses, a driver, and a warrior. Board. Granted, this is all new to me, but traveling at a gallop takes a little bit of getting used to. <laughs> all right. Ah. It's a bit harrowing. There's absolutely no shock absorption. So even on a field like this, which looks pretty flat, I could feel every stone that went under the wheel. But getting to the battlefield was only half of it. Remember, this is war. And in the Iliad, there's no shortage of depictions of gruesome fight scenes, people doing battle on the back of their chariots. Now, for me, as a competitive archer, firing from stable ground, not that big a problem. But. Could it be done from the back of a moving chariot? Let's go find out. Ah, a low shot. Even with a modern bow, this stuff's pretty tricky. Archaeologists are still searching for proof of exactly how ancient Greek warfare was conducted. Concrete evidence exists of that. Bronze Age chariots, okay. arrows, and spears. All right, here we go. Debate continues as to exactly how these weapons were used in combination. But there's no doubt that they were deadly. That's a flesh wound. Oh, I think that would hurt. Uh, I think that this shows that with the spear, with the bow and arrow, with the sword, the weapons of the late Bronze Age were incredibly effective. So far on the trail of Homer, I've discovered the cities, the weapons, and even the armor described in the Iliad and the Odyssey. But now I want to know, if the Greek army really traveled to Troy to wage war, how did they get there? Did the Greeks of the Late Bronze Age have ships that could make the journey, as Homer described? If the Trojan War actually happened, the Greek sailors had to somehow cross the Aegean. I've come to the ancient port of Volos, where shipbuilding has gone on for thousands of years. 
I'm here to meet an admiral who says he can show me how it was done the old-fashioned way. Rear Admiral Apostolos Quartus and his team are building a pentacopter, one of the earliest in a long line of Greek naval warships. This could be the kind of battleship used in the Trojan War. Bronze Age artwork indicates that warships of the period had a flat front and three main structural elements joined at the stern. Homer's Greek fleet sets off for Troy in boats seating 50 rowers each. The Admiral and his team are setting out to build a ship exactly to the scale described. We have no nails. No metal nails? No nails. So these are the Eventually, nails. they'll test their theory that these boats are fast and maneuverable in the water, but they have to build one first. Okay, and the tools they're using, these are, are traditional tools? Yes, single hand tools. Hand tools, no machinery? No. So during the Trojan War, the shipbuilders had a crew of 50 yes. to build their uh, ships. How big is your crew? Big. One, two, three. So they had 50, you yes. have three to four. Yes. For Apostolos and his team, the ship is a labor of love. But it's also an exercise in experimental archaeology. The tools they're using are exact replicas of those found in Mycenaean tombs from the late Bronze Age. We have uh, primary findings of this kind of tools. At the time, these tools were at the cutting edge of technology. The new science of bronze smelting gave shipbuilders a precision in woodworking previously impossible. That, and then making only the bow drill seems slow going. But its hardworking tip, along with other bronze tools like the hammer and chisel, were innovations that helped usher in the bigger, stronger ships of the era. Okay, so we're. It's a lot of work for Apostolos, but the framework of his ship is slowly taking shape. He's got plenty left to do. And I still need to prove that the ships from the late Bronze Age could sail to the other side of the Aegean. I'm heading back to Turkey in search of clues to prove that Mycenaean soldiers, the ancient Greek army, had ships capable of reaching this coast in the late Bronze Age, as they did in the songs of Homer. Here in Turkey, evidence of such Greek journeys may exist in ancient shipwrecks off the coast. Yashar Yildiz is the director of the Museum of Underwater Archaeology in Bodrum. He wants to take me to an area with one of the highest concentrations of shipwrecks in the world. In ancient times, reefs like the one we're approaching were incredibly dangerous to mariners. Just below the surface and close to shore, such hazards spelled doom for captains for as long as ships have been crossing into this region. And it's in these waters that a Trojan War era shipwreck was discovered and excavated. Yasha says I can see remains from that ship later in the museum back on shore. But first, I'm going for a dive. And no, I'm not diving with that. There's no telling what archeological treasures might remain along this coast. These waters have become world famous for their scuba diving, and no wonder. Immediately, a world of decaying shipwrecks is visible. As Yashar guides me deeper, it becomes obvious that the modern wreck is just one of many. Clearly, this pot did not come from that big steel ship. This huge modern anchor chain has come to rest on a pile of ancient pottery litter nearly 2,000 years old.
Honestly, this is the most incredible dive site I've ever seen. For archaeologists, this is a gold mine. It's obvious that sunken ships and cargo like this can provide incredible insight into the lives of ancient civilizations. But what can it teach us about the Trojan War? That was, that was a good dive. I gotta, I gotta shake your hand for that. Then get over there. That was a great dive. Great dive, yes. Great dive. I'm for it. Dashar tells me that the wrecks we just saw below date backwards from 1960 to around 150 AD. Sites like this one have provided archaeologists with a wealth of information about the nautical history of the area. But none is more important to my quest than a Bronze Age galley discovered in 1982. Its cargo is on display at the Bodrum Museum of Underwater Archaeology. Dr. Jamal Pulak directed excavations on the shipwreck Uluburun. So I've looked at second century AD shipwreck. This, much older. Yes. Can you tell me the story? That's second century AD. Yeah. This is uh, 14th century BC, so this is 1,500 years older than the wreck that you've been on. It's the oldest shipwreck to have been excavated and, and also has the, uh, the wealthiest and the most diverse cargo ever found from the Bronze Age. In the scattered remains of the wreck, Jamal and his team discovered copper plates from the Middle East. Pottery from what's now Syria, Israel, Lebanon, and Cyprus. Elephant tusks and ebony logs from equatorial Africa. Colored glass and tin from Central Asia. And gold from Egypt. What it does tell us that uh, the greater part of the Mediterranean in antiquity was connected extensively with trade networks. Do we know where it was going to? I think it was going to Greece or uh, Greek mainland because there were also Mycenaeans or Bronze Age Greeks on board. Really? Based, based on the finds, yes, I think we had at least two, of, uh, two Mycenaeans on board because we have two uh, swords, uh, we have two uh, seals, we have two pectorals or glass beads that the Mycenaean elite wore. Everything that you can imagine that a wealthy individual, an elite in individual would carry. So I think they represented emissaries or envoys that were on board the ship escorting the vessel to their homeland. Uluburun was a cargo ship, not a warship. So this was not the Greek galley of the Trojan War. But it proves that the world of the Mediterranean and Aegean seas were connected in the late Bronze Age through an established system of seagoing trade. And it proves that Greeks from Mycenae were intimately involved. They were a rich and powerful trading empire and they were clearly more than capable of reaching the city of Troy by sea, armed for war. I'm on the trail of the Trojan War, following clues from the Iliad and the Odyssey. I've journeyed through both Greece and Turkey to learn that a world of fierce warriors and incredible riches did exist, much as the poet Homer described. I've crossed the Aegean Sea, and beneath its clear waters discovered evidence that the Greek army could have sailed to Troy armed for war. Now, I'm going back to Troy to find out what scientists have learned at what would have been the battlefield itself. The scars left by Heinrich Schliemann's excavations at Troy remain today. Within his massive trench, and across the ancient city, archaeologists have continued his search for evidence of the Trojan War. I'm back with Dr. Yashar Ersoy, who wants to tell me what scientists have discovered since Schliemann. Archaeologists now agree that for over 3,200 years, civilizations, one after another, flourished here and collapsed. Nine cities were built and destroyed and the ruins here at Troy contain remains from all of them. In his zeal to discover Homer's Troy, it appears Heinrich Schliemann dug far deeper than he ever had to. His brutal excavations likely destroyed much of the evidence he'd hoped to find. 
But enough clues did remain for later archaeologists to determine which city layer here was contemporary with the period Homer describes. Shards of pottery similar in style to what I saw back at Mycenae were found in the sixth level of Troy in abundance. These artifacts were some of the major clues archaeologists used to identify the sixth level as Homer's Bronze Age Troy. But according to Yashar, it wasn't the Mycenaean Greeks who destroyed it. This is uh, from the sixth settlement. Level six. Level six, okay. which is actually contemporary with the Mycenaean Greeks. It was reached to an end by a major destruction. Some sort of catastrophe. That is exactly the case. Wow. Now, if you put it in the 13th century BC, this is around the time that people attribute Homer's writings in the Trojan War to have happened. It is contemporary, but it is beyond the limits of the human agency. This, uh, the cause of this uh, event must have been not by the human agency, but instead it, it was a natural disaster, namely an earthquake. An earthquake? Wow, OK. And that's shown in the archaeological record how? Buildings were collapsed, walls were dismantled, fortification systems were partly disintegrated. So it seemed like this was a severe catastrophic event, which caused the end of the Sixth Settlement at Troy. For Yashar, discoveries at Troy so far point to natural disaster and not war as the cause of the destruction of the Bronze Age city. This appears to be the city from the songs of the Iliad and the Odyssey. But concrete proof of Homer's 10-year war has not been found so far. So what would archaeologists need to be able to say the Trojan War is a true historical event? The physical evidence of it, mm -hmm. the destructions, uh, the destruction of the structures by fire, by human agency, mm -hmm. corpses laying on the, on, on the streets with the weaponry that they carry. That kind of tragic evidence will be enough to say that. Otherwise, we are basically trapped. The smoking gun, so to speak, the, the archaeological evidence that we would need to say They're this missing. happened. Yeah, it's missing. They are so far missing, unfortunately. Okay. For more than 130 years, Archaeologists have been on a quest to prove that the war described by Homer was a real historical event. The Iliad and Odyssey have proven to be invaluable treasure maps, which have led to great riches. But more importantly, they've led to the very cities Homer described. They've given us the gift of a marvelous insight into the weapons, the cultures, and the technologies of the late Bronze Age. But for the archaeologist, required to make judgments from evidence, not conjectures, it seems that the Trojan horse, Agamemnon's warriors at the doorstep of the strong-walled city, and the beautiful Helen of Troy can only be said to have lived for certain in the songs of an ancient poet whose tales remain among the greatest ever told. Join me as I go in search of one of the most enigmatic women in all of history, the Queen of Sheba. The Bible says she appeared from the desert leading a caravan of riches to the court of King Solomon in Jerusalem. Many cultures claim her as their own, but what's the truth behind the stories? To find out, I'll explore ruined temples in Ethiopia, follow ancient caravan routes through biblical lands, and head into the dangerous tribal no man's land of modern Yemen. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it.
exotic romance surrounds the legend of the Queen of Sheba. In folk tales and scripture, she's described as beautiful and captivating, sophisticated and powerful, and very, very wealthy. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein. My quest is to determine if the Queen of Sheba really existed, and if so, where she came from. My first stop is the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. The library here has one of the greatest collections of religious texts in the United States. Most of what's known about the Queen of Sheba comes from just a few short passages in the Bible, and I'm hoping that one of the scholars here can help me flesh out her story. According to 1 Kings, the queen journeyed to Jerusalem at the head of a long caravan of gold, precious stones, and spices, which she presented as gifts to King Solomon. But what the Bible doesn't say is where the land of Sheba actually was. Dr. Doug Gropp is an expert in Middle Eastern texts, and I've asked him to help me decipher other passages that may offer some interesting clues. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 20. The Lord says, Lamazeli Levona Mishvatavo, what is frankincense to me, which comes from Sheba? Doug tells me that the spice the queen brought to King Solomon was frankincense, an aromatic resin that was one of the most prized goods of the ancient world, more precious than even silver or gold. What makes this clue so useful is that frankincense comes from a very limited geographic area. This means I should be able to trace the trade routes back to the Queen's homeland fairly easily, or so I hope. In the ancient world, it came from South Arabian area and on the other side of the Red Sea and the Horn of Africa. And that's it? That's pretty much it. So Sheba right. could be that region. Right. Somewhere, okay. Somewhere in that region. Is there any place else in the Bible we can learn about Sheba? Well, there's a few other places uh, that mention Sheba, but there's also a related term, a term that most scholars think is related that has just a different S sound, uh, Seba. And Doug explains that Sheba sometimes appears with a slightly different spelling and pronunciation. He shows me a passage from the Old Testament book of Isaiah that speaks of a land called Seba, and more importantly, gives a pretty precise clue about where it may have been. Okay, so Seba is a region either south of Sudan or in that, in that yeah. area, the Horn of Africa yeah. area, right. which again is the Ethiopia right. area. Right. And we have one more passage. Another passage from Isaiah describes the people I'm looking for and even gives them a name. And the Sabaeans, who are described as unshamida, men of stature, huh. tall, tall men, well, the tall people. Are, Ethiopians are pretty tall. Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. I have a picture here of Solomon and Sheba's meeting. Doug tells me uh, that the Ethiopian story of the Queen of Sheba is uh, one of the most elaborate and that it plays an important role in the country's history. So Ethiopia definitely has a very historical and even tangible connection with the Queen of Sheba. Yeah, it's absolutely central to their whole national consciousness. So the Queen of Sheba may have been from Ethiopia, or she may have been from South Arabia. But based on what I just heard, it sounds like Ethiopia has a slight advantage. So it looks like I'm going to Africa. I hop an Ethiopian Airlines flight across the Atlantic to the Horn of Africa. I've been to Ethiopia before looking for the Ark of the Covenant, and I'm really excited to be back. I start my search for evidence of the queen in the northern highlands of the country, in a sleepy village with a very promising local nickname. This is the town of Lalibela. It's also called the New Jerusalem, and it's considered by many to be the holiest place in Ethiopia. But is there a connection between this Jerusalem and the Jerusalem visited by the Queen of Sheba? Let's go find out. At first glance, the town doesn't bear much resemblance to Solomon's capital. But there's an elaborate complex of churches here that give the place its holy status and famous nickname. To help me learn the lay of the land, 
I'm meeting up with Asnake Hubete of Addis Ababa University. Okay, so I've heard that this place is called the New Jerusalem. Yes, you see, in Ethiopian tradition, it is said to have been that King Laliwela, in order to minimize the journey of Ethiopians to Jerusalem, he was said to have Asnaki been... Asnaki explains that Lalibela is a pilgrimage site modeled on Holy Jerusalem, the same city where King Solomon first impressed the Queen of Sheba with his wisdom. Could this place be part of that legacy? As we come upon the first of the churches, it becomes clear just how inspired Lalibela was. The site is made up of 11 churches, all carved seamlessly from the mountain bedrock, complete with windows and doors. Over the centuries, hundreds of thousands of souls have come to pray here. Even now, it's a thriving center of faith. Everywhere we go, we pass monks and nuns who are immersed in prayer oblivious to our presence. As we pass through one of the dozens of tunnels and passageways on our way to the most sacred of the churches, Asnake fills in the details of the Ethiopian version of the Queen of Sheba legend. Ethiopians believe that from northern Ethiopia, Queen of Sheba, she went to Jerusalem to visit King Solomon. The story that Asnake tells me begins the same way as the biblical tale I heard in Washington. The queen, at the head of a caravan of jewels and incense, journeys to Jerusalem to pay her respects to Solomon. Once in Jerusalem, though, the Ethiopian version takes a very different turn. King Solomon went to sleep with her because of her beauty and her fame, but she refused. According to the legend, the queen resisted Solomon's efforts to seduce her. He promised to leave her be, so long as she agreed not to take anything belonging to him. He then set a trap. Solomon served the queen a lavish feast of spicy, salty food, but offered her no water to drink. Forbidden from asking him for anything, she went to bed with her thirst unquenched. Solomon's trap was set. In the dead of night, the queen awoke, desperately thirsty. She searched the palace for water, but the only pitcher had been placed next to the king's bed. The queen had broken her promise, and Solomon felt entitled to break his. According to the legend, the queen bore Solomon a son as a result of that night. Named Menelik I, he founded the Solomonic dynasty in Ethiopia, a dynasty that lasted 3,000 years and ended only with the death of the Emperor Haile Selassie in 1975. Drawing such a connection is a critical part of Ethiopian history and identity. By tracing their descent to Solomon through the Queen of Sheba, the Ethiopians thus become children of Israel and among God's chosen people. The spiritual importance of this new Jerusalem is even more apparent once we reach our destination, the most dramatic church in all of Lalibela. Carved into the shape of a cross, Bet Georgos, or the House of St. George, was the last of the churches to be constructed. The elegant workmanship and fine detail speak to the extra care that was taken in carving it. As we descend through the winding trench towards the entrance, I can't get over how incredible this place is. What's amazing is that a lot of the stone that they had to remove to make those temples had to go out these narrow quarters. Look at how narrow that is. Once we're inside, it's clear that other visitors here have been even more affected by the magic of this place. Some of the monks spend years living like hermits in holes carved in the wall, to be as close as possible to the church and to God. Some of them would never leave the church and pray all the time here throughout their life. The whole lifetime? Yes. Living in and, wow. and some of them never leave this holy place. So people really did everything they could to be close to this place. Yes, yes. And this is one example, for instance, 
these are skeletons of people who were believed to have come from Jerusalem, Jewish people. Asnaki shows me the skeletons of pilgrims that the local folklore says came all the way from Jerusalem to pray here at Lalibela. Wow, it's a little bit creepy, huh? Yeah. Their piety was so great that they were left here in death to continue their devotion. Yes. They came here to pray. Yeah. And then they spent their whole lives here. After they came here, they decided to remain here throughout their life. And they died. It's clear here. that Jerusalem and the Queen have a profound spiritual influence here. But what does this tell me about where to find her? This is a very nice question. Snaki says that Lalibela was completed only 700 years ago. Scholars believe the Queen of Sheba would have ruled in the 10th century BC, nearly 3,000 years ago. So I clearly need to go further back in time to find a tangible connection to the Queen. But Asnaki tells me there is a civilization in Ethiopia that could date back far enough. I just have to travel a bit farther north to find it. Could this be the Sabaean kingdom that Doug told me about back in Washington? I've come to the Horn of Africa searching for the Queen of Sheba and learned that one of the gifts she brought to Solomon was frankincense, which comes from only a few places around the Red Sea. In Ethiopia, I visited a place called the New Jerusalem, where I learned how important the queen is to Ethiopian national identity. Now I'm following a lead that's brought me into Tigray province, the heart of frankincense country. I've hooked up with my old friend, Ms. Ghana Gananu, to learn more about this precious commodity. So frankincense has been used in Ethiopia for thousands of years. Just from thousand and thousand years ago. The land of frankincense. The Bible says the queen brought Solomon quantities of incense that would never be equal. Learning the history of frankincense in Ethiopia could shed light on whether the queen might have started her journey here. Frankincense is used throughout Ethiopia throughout all types of religious ceremonies. All type of religious. When we have the church, mass, the service, it should not be without incense. No incense, no service, no incense, no life. And now we're going to go see how it's actually Now done. it is the same way of the doing from all tradition until now. So the process hasn't changed too much? Not too much. Everything is doing by hand. Here is We've come incense. to the town of Shire where frankincense is still processed in the traditional way for sale throughout Africa and the Middle East. Working in this building inside. As soon as we walk in, I can see why, he said, things haven't changed much. This is how they are preparing for market, for selling. Everyone here is working on frankincense. When they come here in Tigray province, frankincense is a major part of the local economy, just as it's been for millennia. Production involves every member of the community. So the, so the mothers work here, the fathers are out there collecting this. They're collecting And the, the kids forestry. don't really have any place to go, so they come here and help they their moms. They come here and help the families, the elders. Okay. The parents. Why don't you show me what's happening right here? She is cutting and you know, separating uh, the best quality inside. Frankincense is harvested as a resin that oozes from cuts made into the Boswellia tree. Good. Frankincense is actually in the bar. The process okay. isn't actually that the different from tapping maple trees to make syrup. Only with frankincense, the, the resin is allowed to harden on the trees. The so resin-encrusted bark is then sliced off and brought here, where these women separate the hardened incense from the wood. That's not so good. We not want so good. Shut around. Okay. I decide to give it a try. She's happy. It's like, hey, he's helping me. Or she's like, hey, he's messing up all my hard work. We'll find out soon. Is that a good piece? No? Ah, OK. See that a little speck there? It's got to come off. I want to make it as, as clean, as clean a resin as possible, right? Clean resin? Yes. Clean resin. She's got to have a really good eye for that, you know? What happens next? OK, I'll show you now. OK. okay. Thank you. Now I'm a second Ah. So this is the second phase. This is the second phase because choppy. The other two. After now she's separating, you know? Yeah. But she's basically winnowing these pieces of bark, small bits of bark. Yeah. At each stage of processing, the incense is refined until it's ready for market. 
The highest grades are exported throughout Africa, the Middle East, and beyond, continuing a trade that began thousands of years ago. So this is the product of all their hard work. Yep. Wow. So if the Queen of Sheba went to Solomon with this, that was an offering. Of course, there is nothing a gift more than this. See? This is worthy of a king. It is a wonderful present. It is the more than gold. Wow. If frankincense has been such an integral part of the economy and culture here for so long, perhaps Tigray province could have been the land of Sheba. We head on to the tiny village of Yeha, just a couple of hours away to check out a temple. I've been told it dates back to the beginnings of civilization in Ethiopia. Ms. Ghana tells me that Yeha was the center of the first state to arise in Ethiopia between 2,500 and 3,000 years ago. This puts it around the right time for the Queen of Sheba. Could there be any relationship between this place and the mysterious Sabaean civilization? The temple is now little more than a shell, but with its high, well-built walls, it must have been quite a sight in its day, perhaps even suitable for a legendary queen. The complex has since been converted into a Christian church, but the shrine's pagan past is apparent everywhere. Elements from the original temple, like these antelope heads built into the church wall, are still revered. Inside, the monks show me their most prized artifacts, inscriptions removed from the temple. Unfortunately, no one here can read them. In fact, the language they're written in doesn't even come from Ethiopia. What the monks can tell me, though, is that the language they're written in is Sabaean, and that it comes from South Arabia. This is exciting information. Doug Gropp told me that the queen might have come from either the Horn of Africa or South Arabia. The evidence here at Yeha indicates that her people may have immigrated to Ethiopia from Arabia which means I'm hot on the trail. I traced the frankincense trail to the Horn of Africa in search of the Queen of Sheba. I learned how the incense is processed, and I explored the ruins of the first Ethiopian state. Now, despite the warnings of the U.S. State Department, I'm heading 100 miles east across the Red Sea to the South Arabian country of Yemen to track the queen and her civilization. My first stop is Sana'a, the ancient capital of Yemen. So I've come from Ethiopia, where I've learned that the Sabayan culture has roots here in Yemen. Of course, yes. What is the relationship? Dr. Hussein Al-Amri is a professor at Sana'a University. The Yemen in that time was a center of uh, merchants, and Sana'a, the capital especially, was one of the oldest troop of Arabs. Really? So this city is one of the oldest markets? Yes, the there were. Hussein believes that the queen civilization was based here in Yemen and was built on commerce. He explains that the Yeha temple I saw in Ethiopia was actually a Sabaean colony, established when they extended their trade networks into the Horn of Africa. So people have been meeting here for thousands of years? Yes, of course, yes. Buying, selling, yeah. watching, spending their time. It's a beautiful city. The Sabaean civilization lay at the crossroads of trade in antiquity, controlling the movement of goods between east and west. Spices from India, gold and ivory from Africa, silks from China, and of course frankincense all passed through the kingdom of Saba before heading north on the caravan routes to the markets of Egypt, Mesopotamia, and the Mediterranean. They seem to sell everything. Special price today, just for you, my friend. But Sana'a wasn't the Sabaean capital. If I'm to find the queen, I need to head to a city called Marib, just 100 miles east over the mountains. But it might as well be a world away. It's in a very conservative, tribal area of the country that's known for its animosity towards outsiders. I'm told in no uncertain terms I should postpone my visit. In order to even make the trip, I need to find the right escort. Hussein sends me to the former governor of Marib and the present governor of Sana'a, Abdul Wahed al Buhiti. Abdul Wahed tells me that the Bedouin who live in Marib highly value their traditional customs. He suggests that before we head out, I should pick up a jambia, 
one of the large daggers that I've seen nearly all the men wearing here in Sana. If participating in the local traditions is the best way to gain acceptance and keep me safe, I'm all for it. Touch this one? It's okay? Yeah, yeah, you can. Then which is more important, the blade or the handle? The handle. The handle? Yeah. You can recognize anyone in the street through his Gambia. So You know he is from this area, he is from that area, this one from this tribe, this one that tribe, by the, his Gambia. Jambias have been an important status symbol in Yemen going back to Sabian times, and they communicate a lot about their owners. History and personality count. The older the Jambia handle, the more prized it is. Abdul Wahid tells me that one sheikh recently paid a million dollars for an especially prized Jambia. What do you think? It's pretty nice, huh? Jamil. In yeah. Arabic, Yamil means nice. Nice. Good? Okay. Very good. Like this or like? Very good. Okay, I guess it's okay. straight up, yeah? Yeah. You are Sadeyan. No. Shukran? All right. This now is that fun. I've got my Jambia, Abdul Wahed gives me a lesson in another time honored Yemeni tradition. Cut. We show it like this. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. You can use it, yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. How you taste it? Yeah, it's got a weird taste. Yeah. Kind it's, of tangy, it's, bitter. It's not, it's Very not dry. sweet. Very dry. What happens when you chew a lot of it? Like these guys are... Make you comfortable. Oh, like mellow. Uh, makes you, uh, wow. works a lot. Uh -huh. You can read a lot. Mm -hmm. And you can't sleep. Can't sleep? Yeah. Ah, Keep so, you up. Interesting. Yeah. And this is a tradition where... Kat is a natural stimulant, chewed by over 80% of the population each afternoon. It feels like about six shots of espresso. Okay. You can eat it. No, I'm, I'm good. It's I'm good. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> what? Okay, what? okay. More. It's weird. Yeah, what? It's weird and get for you to eat it. It's not enough just to taste it. I have to have more. I've got to sign on for the full experience. It's weird and get for you to eat it all. Oh, my God. So you can do it like this. Really? Uh-huh. So I, I okay. wouldn't want to offend him. No, okay. Nothing uh, will happen. It's okay. fine. It's fine. <laughs> I wish I could tell you what this tastes like, but it's like nothing else I've ever had. Okay. It's really bitter. Like maybe if you ate a whole bunch of dandelion greens, but wow, oh. bitter, bitter. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna wait until I get some sort of effect, and I'll just float away. Okay. Now uh, we can be here. Now that I've had my crash course in Yemeni culture, I'm ready to head into the tribal desert. All right. So I'll settle up with this man here. Okay. I don't know if it's my excitement or the lingering effects of the cut, but the next morning, as the call to prayer signals dawn, I can't wait to hit the road. Good morning. It's a beautiful day. I've got my jambia, and now I've got to meet Abdul Wahed. We're going to Marib. Yalla. The road to Marib takes me from the mountainous highlands of Sana through some spectacular scenery to the flat, dusty edge of the vast desert known as the Empty Quarter. I'm going to meet Abdul Wahed along the route. He's traveled ahead to guarantee my safety in this lawless zone. Over the years, this road has developed a well-earned reputation for highway robbery. Good morning. Some of the tribes have been known to kidnap travelers and hold them for ransom. It's been good. Traveling with yeah, Abdul Wahed should make things go smoothly, okay. but even he takes precautions. I got to admit, this is my first time traveling in a car with three armed guards carrying machine guns. It's a little unsettling. You always travel with guards? Huh? You always travel with guards? With armed guards? Yeah. When you come to Marab, you need to have guns. Things have gotten better in recent years, but the 14 checkpoints we pass through along the way speak to the still volatile conditions.
100 miles later, we arrive safely at the outskirts of the city. As we approach the ancient town, I see buildings rising in the distance. When we get closer, though, it becomes clear that what I see is a city of ruins. Abdul Wahed explains that these buildings date back some 300 years, but that the city's foundations go back nearly 3,000, to the time of the Queen of Sheba. After so many centuries of civilization, it was a modern war in the 1960s that finally left Old Marib a crumbling relic, inhabited by only a few lonely squatters. As we move on, I can only hope that the rest of Marib's ancient past hasn't met a similar fate, and that something of the queen can still be found. I've traveled from the Horn of Africa to the deserts of Arabia in search of the Queen of Sheba. In the old city of Sana'a, I was welcomed by the local governor, Abdul Wahed al-Buhiti, who's escorting me through the lawless tribal deserts of Yemen. The Bedouin are famous for their hospitality, but hostility can also arise at a moment's notice, which we soon found out. After we left the ancient city of Marib, heavily armed tribesmen surrounded our camp in the middle of the night. We were literally under house arrest. In a place where foreigners are routinely kidnapped, the stakes were very high. Thankfully, Abdul Wahed has taken pains to help me navigate the terrain. Drawing on his contacts from his days as governor here, Abdul Wahed has called a meeting of the local tribal sheikhs so that I can pay my respects and prove my intentions. I make sure to do all the right things. I'm dressed appropriately with my new jambia and a traditional tribal skirt called a futa, and I pay close attention to all the local customs. I notice custom says we eat with the right hand only. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then the rice, you just kind of oh. grab the rice? Okay. Run. Abdul Wahed explains my quest to the sheikhs, and the famous Bedouin hospitality quickly takes the place of the hostility, at least for now. Cool. So this type of gathering hasn't changed much over the thousands of years, right? Not a lot. No. This water and the bottles. Yeah. It's changed. Okay. It's new. And some of the foods, maybe. The rice is new. Cell phones. Cell phones. Cell phones are new. Yeah, it's new. Okay. After dinner, we sit around the fire to share stories about the Queen of Sheba that have been handed down through generations here in Marib. It's okay. Ah, very nice, he said. Yemeni. Yemeni, yes. Mm -hmm. My new jambia goes over well. In Ethiopia, the legends I heard about the Queen of Sheba were very detailed and played a big part in defining Ethiopian national identity. Now that I'm here in Yemen, I want to hear the Yemenis tell her story and find out about the place she occupies in their history and culture. They believe she came from the far desert and she is for sure from Marib. They feel a honor because Queen of Sheba from their land, from their hometown. I hear tales of a beautiful young woman named Bilkis, who appeared from the dunes to assume the throne of the kingdom of Saba. To the sheikhs, there's no doubt that this kingdom here in Marib and the biblical land of Sheba are one and the same. The Quran also tells vivid stories about the kingdom that Bilqis ruled, and what's more, where to find its remains. It was a heaven. Saba have two heavens. The sheikhs explain that the land of Saba is described in the Quran as land of the two paradises. The name comes from two oases created by a massive dam the Sabaeans built here in Marib, a dam whose ruins, they tell me, can still be seen nearby. It sounds like I need to go to see this dam and to explore Marib further. Do I have the permission of the sheikhs to do so? 
هل يستطيع ان يعتبر انه لديه تصريح من المشايخ يتحرك بمارب حيث ما يشاء؟ هذه تعتبر خير مع الجنبيه يمنيه. اها ذيس ذيس جنبيه؟ اتس لايك اتس لايك ا برميشن فور يو تو جو اني وير. اوكي. سو اف اي هاف ذير برميشن ذاتس اول اي نيد. شكرا. اوكي. ثانك يو فور ذيس. شكرا على العشاء شكرا على هذا الوقت شكرا على المقابلة شكرا My evening with the sheikhs went over very well. Not only did I gain their permission to explore their land, but the stories they told me about the Queen of Sheba have inspired me. Now my goal is to search for archaeological evidence to support their stories. I've arranged to meet archaeologist Zaydun Zaid at the Marib Dam to tell me more. So this is one of the towers of the Dam of Marib. Yeah, this is the north tower, that's right. Where's uh, the other one? The south tower, just ahead of your eyes, that part, you see it? There, wow, the south one. There. Wow. So there was a wall going The dam's this wall stretched from where we're standing all the way to the south tower, over 2,000 feet away. That made it about twice as wide as the Hoover Dam. The water it controlled was used to irrigate the valley below, supporting an estimated 35 to 50,000 people. So this really must have been a lush green valley. Well, it, it, as you can see now, it's still green. And you yeah. can imagine at that time, it was much, much, much better. more. Yeah. The water was, which was coming out of here was supporting at the two sides of it, something like paradise. Two at two sides of them, one at the right, one at the left. Uh, I've right. heard about this. So this is the left paradise and the right paradise. Exactly. That's, uh. that's it. The dam worked by collecting runoff from the mountains and then channeling the water into sluice gates on either side of the two towers. The gates, in turn, led to canals that branched into the valley below, creating the oases that gave Saba the name Land of the Two Paradises. As Zaydun and I make our way to the South Tower, I ask him what led to the collapse of this incredible structure and the civilization that built it. There's two theories about it. One which will say that the dam was destroyed by a strong earthquake. Zaydun says that an earthquake may have toppled the dam, or an unusually heavy rainy season could have damaged it beyond repair. In either case, the march of history also played a part. A shift in trade routes away from their territory had already dramatically weakened the kingdom, and they were unable to recover from the loss of the dam. What I've seen so far supports what I've heard about a flourishing civilization. But what about the queen? It's thought she would have reigned in the 10th century BC. So here we are. Josh, wow. what else to talk about? Does the archaeological evidence here date back far enough? Well, uh, the construction of the dam went through different phases, and what we are looking, in fact, at the latest of it. Well, Inscriptions the on the tower are written in the same Sabaean script I first saw in Ethiopia. Though they date this phase of the dam to the 7th century BC, after the time of the queen, Zaydun tells me that this is only the latest construction. Its origins go back far earlier. The Sabaeans continually updated and improved their dam over centuries. The Sabaean civilization managed to block this canyon in 1500 BC. So they finished building the dam at that point. But the history of damming using water goes back up to 3,200 BC. If this is true, the Sabaean civilization in Marib would have existed at the time the queen made her journey to Jerusalem. In fact, it would have been thriving. All that remains is to find her, and Zaydun has an answer for that, too. So it would, it would make sense that somewhere in this region is a palace, and perhaps a queen. A queen with a temple. And is that true? Is there some place around here where that exists? Yeah, exactly. The temple of the Queen of Sheba. Right here? Right here. My search for the Queen of Sheba has taken me across the world and thousands of years back in time. In a religious archive, I heard the stories of her journey to Jerusalem to visit King Solomon. In Ethiopia, I learned that frankincense could have provided her with the wealth she was famous for. Here in Yemen, I discovered that she and her civilization appear in the Quran and in the oral traditions of the local people. I've now come to the possible seat of her civilization, a sand-swept temple that bears her name, Mahram Bilqis. 
the sanctuary of the Queen of Sheba. To learn what it reveals of the Queen, I'm meeting up with another extraordinary woman. Marilyn Phillips Hodgson of the American Foundation for the Study of Man has been excavating here for nearly a decade. It's a pleasure to be here. Before we explore the temple, Marilyn and I must pay our respects to the sheikh who watches over the site. Sheikh Marzouk and his sons keep a close eye on the Mahram Bilqis, the centerpiece of their heritage, and they want to be sure of my intentions. I'm grateful that the sheikh is welcoming me because he's packing a lot of heat. My explorations here in Marib have attracted some attention, and while I have the blessing of the tribes to be here, I still have to tread carefully. After some friendly diplomacy, we're given the go-ahead to explore the temple grounds. So this wall, is, this was the first thing discovered here. Well, sure, because everything else was covered by sand. Marilyn tells me that the entire complex encompasses 37 acres, making it the largest ancient temple in the entire Arabian Peninsula. But only a small percentage of it has actually been excavated. Working here is a never-ending battle against the blowing sands, which rebury much of the site between digging seasons. I asked Marilyn how she came to work in such a forbidding place. I came here because I wanted to fulfill my brother's unfinished dreams, but now it's my passion. The Mahram Bilqis was first excavated by Marilyn's brother, Wendell Phillips, in the early 1950s. When he began, the site was almost entirely covered in sand. And though his dig lasted only one season, he uncovered a wealth of artifacts. So your brother brings his archaeological team here. They start excavating. What happened? They found many, many exciting, wonderful treasures. One of the greatest is, I happen to have a picture here to show you. Oh, yeah. It's every, every Yemeni has a picture of it, because it's on the 50 real note. Wow. Wow, so this was such an exciting find that they actually put it on their money. That's right. More than four feet high warrior, one of the rulers of this great area. That's impressive. It is. The statue that Wendell Phillips found is considered to be one of the masterpieces of Sabian art. It depicts a ruler called the Mahdi Karib, complete with a jambia at his waist. This statue from the 6th century BC helped put a face to the queen's glorious civilization. Unfortunately, Wendell was never able to finish his work. Tribal strife forced him to flee Marib after just four months on the site. He didn't want to leave. It was a terrible heartbreak. They left all their cars, all the artifacts, everything remained behind. So after making these world-class discoveries, he has to flee for his life? Yes. So what happens to this site? It filled up with sand, and only the great pillars showed there, uh -huh. and uh, the Awam enclosure, the Great Wall. This space that we're sitting in now, 18 feet above us, was, was all sand. All sand. Wow. Nearly 50 years passed before Marilyn and her team were able to return to Marib. Since work has resumed, the foundation has unearthed much more of the site. This is like the Library of Congress, then. Yes. We're joined by the assistant site director, Yemeni archaeologist Abdu Ghalib, who shows me some of their recent discoveries. So anything that had to do with daily life or was important to them, they put on these stones. They built a till. The Mahram Bilqis is literally covered in inscriptions from top to bottom. The elegant South Arabian script that I've seen throughout my journey adorns nearly every surface of the temple. This inscription talking about social, economic, and about the, the tribes, the names, and what they believe, you know. Abdu tells me that all aspects of daily life were recorded here from ritual dedications to social and economic histories. And the foundation's team has only scratched the surface. So, below this. Below, below this. Yeah. Below this goes back to the 8th century BC, but it's covered now by sand again. So if you were to dig down. If you dig down, you will go down, 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 15 meters. Like the Great Dam of Marib, the Mahram Bilqis was improved and expanded over successive generations. To date, they have yet to find any inscriptions referring to the Queen of Sheba. But the deeper they dig, the further back in time they go, and thus closer to the time of the Queen. 
I ask Abdu and Marilyn if what they found can shed any light on the legends I've heard throughout my journey. This is the main gate of the temple. They take me to a newly Be discovered temple. area of the temple, where they show me a grand staircase decorated with antelope heads. I've seen these before in Ethiopia, and both cultures claim to have this belief that the Queen of Sheba is from their homeland. Yeah, because the Queen of Sheba is the Queen of Saba. You know, uh, she's a, a Sabaean uh, a queen, and the people who lived and, in Ethiopia and established the kingdom of Ethiopia are Sabaean people. Wow. So this the, helps explain the Ethiopians' wife, beliefs that they're descended from the Queen of Sheba. In a way, they are, or at least from her civilization. Why you see the similar decoration and language? Yeah, and writing. So this was the center. I mean, actually, we're standing at the center of the Sabaean civilization. Yes. And if the Queen of Sheba, which sounds like it, if the Queen of Sheba lived here, then her influence would have spread throughout her domain, and that, you said, went into Ethiopia. Exactly. And that's why they believe that, they, that she was their queen as well. Yeah, that's, wow. that's right. It is, it, you know, Marilyn and Abdu you have you. one last thing they yeah. want me to see. Yeah. At the top of the staircase, they bring me to a wall covered in sand and invite me to help them dig. Okay. Abdu explains that they rebury this treasured artifact after each season to protect it from the elements. Look at that. Yeah. It's a face. As we clear away the sand, I can see why they take so much care. Who found this? Me and Midland when we were digging here in 2001. That must have been pretty exciting. Yeah, oh, it was. Okay. <laughs> it was very exciting Look at here. that. So. Every time you see it, what do you think? It it's became difference. more beautiful. More beautiful? Yes. No. This is my favorite discovery, even though it's not as early as the time of the Queen of Sheba. I'm sure that when we do see the tashu of the Queen of Sheba, she will be something like this. It's clear that the Mahram Bilkis is an incredible archaeological site. Every season of digging reveals more about the remarkable Sabaean civilization and brings Marilyn and Abdu closer to finding the real Queen of Sheba. She speaks to you. She says, keep digging. Yeah, we'll keep digging. And to think that just by digging another 10 meters, you could come face to face with the most famous queen in the world. Yeah, somewhere we are going to find the Queen of Sheba. So you don't believe it's a question of if, but just a question of when? It's a question of time and a question of work. So we're going to find her here. My mission to uncover the real story of the Queen of Sheba has been a success. I haven't found her yet, but I have found her civilization and learned firsthand how she became so important to cultures in both South Arabia and the Horn of Africa. Perhaps Marilyn and Abdu will find her here, and perhaps very soon. What is certain is that the story of this legendary queen will continue to captivate.